Okay. Open co-host record. All set. All righty. Let's let's get the show on the road. Okay. And I'm just going to um, I'm just gonna mute everyone here to start. Looks like everyone's pretty good with that. So I'll just leave that. Okay. All right, well, th thanks for joining today. And um, let's see. All right, let's start. Um, so hello, my name is Jim O'Connell. Um, and I wanna welcome you tonight to our webinar on What's all this talk about heat pumps? Uh, the webinar is hosted by Westford Climate Action and Westford's Clean Energy and Sustainability Committee. And it's part of an ongoing series to inform us about new technologies and lifestyle changes that help us get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Uh, Westford Climate Action, of, of which I am a member, is a group of local residents concerned about the climate crisis with a mission to drive climate action by promoting sustainability in advocating on a local level for actions that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So, so tonight's webinar is all about heat pumps. Uh, what is a heat pump? Why do I need one? Uh, will it save me money? Um, I'd like thank you for joining, and I know you will find a lot of this very informative. Uh, before we start, I just ask that you all mute your microphones if you haven't already uh, for during the presentations. And if you have any questions, um, just please type them into the chat window. Um, and okay, and, uh, and what we'll do is at the end of the presentations, we'll, we've uh, set aside some time for, um, for going over um, all the questions and getting you answers. So um, if you're not familiar with Zoom, on the bottom of your screen towards the middle, you should see a button for chat. And if you click on that, a separate window should open up and you can type your questions in there. Um, okay. Also in the chat window, if you look at the top, I know some folks have already typed into the window, which is great. Um, I added some links. Um, for uh, helpful resources, that you might things you might find helpful. Um, also at the very top, you'll find a link. Um, the Clean Energy and Sustainability Committee is conducting a town-wide climate survey. And I encourage you to complete the survey when you have some time. Um, and if you can, share the link with some other residents because they're, uh, they're very interested in getting more feedback. Okay, so let's, let's start. Um, so every day in the media, you hear about solar panels, wind farms, electric cars, and the push to make our electric grids more renewable. But for many of us, there's an elephant in the room, a large greenhouse gas emitter sitting in our basement. <laughs> it's our fossil fuel furnace, boiler, or water heater. Um, upgrading your furnace is not as cool as having a Tesla in your driveway, but addressing it is just as important. And since you don't replace your furnace very often, it's critical that you make the right decision when you do. As we'll learn, residential heating is a close second to transportation and contributes about 30% of all of Westford's greenhouse gas emissions. Tonight, we have some subject matter experts and experienced residents to help us understand the technology and why it may be a good fit in your home. A heat pump not only reduces your emissions, but it may make your home more comfortable and save you money. All right, so the first person we have tonight just find Neil on the list. Um, the first person we have to speak tonight is um, I'd like to introduce Neil Duffy from the Mass Department of Energy Resources, Green Communities. And he was going here to talk to us about the Mass Net Zero Roadmap. Thanks, Jim, and uh, thanks, thanks to the uh, Westford Climate Action and uh, Westford Clean Energy and Sustainability Committee for having me tonight. It's uh, great to be here, great turnout. Looks like there's a lot of interest in the subject, um, which is really exciting. Um, as Jim had mentioned, I'm, I'm Neil Duffy. I'm the Northeast Regional Coordinator for the uh, Green Communities Division at Mass Department of Energy Resources. So. Um, 
my job mainly entails working with municipalities like Westford um, in the Northeast region of our state. Um, on, and, and the focus is reducing municipal energy use and emissions. Um, so, you know, your schools, your library, that sort of thing, um, municipal fleet. Uh, so I'm not a, um, a policy maker in DOER, but I'm sure, certainly aware of and more of a policy implementer. <laughs> um, so, um, but excited to be here and invited, was invited just to provide a little context of how air source heat pumps fit into the overall goals of the state and our, um, our climate goals and, and targets. Um, so this should be brief and then we can get into the nitty gritty of air source heat pumps with the other presenters. Um, in March of 2021, uh, Governor Baker just signed legislation which set um, new goals, new more aggressive goals, which was building on uh, the 2008 Global Warming Solutions Act, um, which set a goal for zero emissions um, in 2050. Uh, but it also allowed for incremental goals along the way, as well as um, sector by sector goals. So transportation sector, building sector, which really um, provides um, sort of a more flexible, hopefully more powerful toolkit for us to get to where we need to be because we have a, a long way to go. Um, the, uh, included in these goals in, the, in this legislation, excuse me, was there was a lot of equity um, elements to this in terms of addressing um, environmental justice communities, as well as low income households. Um, and there's also in the legislation um, provisions that uh, the state and the Mass Save Incentive Program needs to address um, the social costs and the social value of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later, I think I will and other presenters as well. So if you go to the next slide, uh, please. Um, so this legislation was um, part of a two year uh, research project, which culminated in a report that was published in December 30th of 2020. Um, it created a decarbonization roadmap. Um, it really looked at Massachusetts specific, how do we get to net zero emissions, uh, modeled various scenarios on ways that we can do this um, and still have a viable economy at the same time. Uh, the good news was there were um, multiple pathways. Um, and so uh, this roadmap provided um, some recommendations on where to go. And then from that, um, the legislation was born on which direction to take. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. So there are really four key components um, to decarbonizing um, as far as the strategy that the state is using. Uh, we need to transition our buildings and vehicles to other end uses away from uh, consuming fossil fuels. We need to uh, aggressively pursue energy efficiency um, and flexibility. Uh, we need to decarbonize our energy supply, and uh, we need to do more to uh, sequester the carbon that's in the atmosphere now. Um, so where air source heat pumps come in is really to reduce the emissions from energy demand and end uses through electrification, um, fuel switching, efficiency, and flexibility. So um, converting existing homes to um, to electric heat to condition them with, with electricity is really a, a major part of this strategy. And as Jim said, it's, it's definitely been an elephant in the room <laughs> for a long time. So uh, next slide, please. So the reason electrification is so important is because by statute and because of the renewable um, energy portfolio standards that we have in Massachusetts in our grid, is our grid, our electric grid is getting cleaner um, every year. And so by 2050, the electric grid emissions will be less than a third of what they are today. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So what that means for homes, and let me just, I'll break this slide down a little bit. Um, so this shows different fuel sources for heating a home. And you can see it says pounds of emissions to deliver one MMBTU of heat into a space. 
Um, an MMBTU is a million British thermal units. So um, it's, I hate to bring the jargon in, but the reason we, we go to MMBTUs is we're converting all of the other um, units into MMBTUs. So in oil, it's gallons and propane, it's gallons and gas, it's therms, electric, uh, it's kilowatt hours. So we, we convert them all to MMBTUs. And this is showing the, the pounds um, of carbon emissions of one MMBTU for each of these uh, fuel sources. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, one MMBTU is about like, you know, maybe a week or two worth of um, the electricity that you would use in your home to put it in context. So what it's showing is that now, today or in 2020, if you convert, if you converted your home from gas to electricity and use air source heat pumps, um, you'd have 45% less emissions right there. If you go to the next slide, please. That same conversion in 2050 using the same equipment would be 85% less. And that's because the grid is getting so clean year in and year out. And so that's why it's vital now that people do these conversions, especially when their equipment's coming towards the end of, end of life. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll end on, on this, and this is, um, some of you may have seen, there was a Globe article um, this past August that talked about these goals and where we need to go and uh, mentioned that we, we need to convert 100,000 homes a year for the next 10 years. And that, the reason that number exists is because it's projected that there are about a million homes um, over the next 10 years that their heating equipment will be um, reaching the end of life. So that's an opportunity where uh, homeowners will be making investments um, in their heating equipment. And we wanna take advantage of that opportunity and hopefully prevent folks from installing uh, fossil fuel equipment, which will be in place for another 20 or so years. Um, this article pointed out that last year, 461 homes um, were converted to fully electric, so we have a long way to go. I do want to mention that there have been a lot of partial conversions, so the number is, is, is significantly larger than 461 in terms of homes that are using air source heat pumps. I think you'll hear from someone tonight who will talk about conversion of their home where they kept the existing system in, which completely makes sense um, as a potential backup because folks want to make sure they can heat their home. Um, I see the question, a partial conversion would be if you leave your existing heating system in and you um, still put in air source heat pumps, um, the idea being if it's really cold, you can still use your existing system as a backup. We've it's been shown pretty well now that that's not necessary um, with the existing air source heat pumps, but that's something that, that's a strategy that folks use. So I just wanna point out that that 461 stat is really referring to full conversions. Um, in response to needing to get, to meet these goals um, that are significant year in and year out, the Baker administration has just created a Clean Heat Commission to help really focus on how we're going to get there. And the incentives, which I'm sure you're interested in, are going to change um, somewhat significantly through the MassSafe program where air source heat pumps will be incentivized um, in a much greater way than they have been before. Um, and that also has to do with the fact that the social cost of greenhouse gas emissions is now part of the equation. Um, the, Program administrators for MassSave, which are the utilities, have submitted a draft plan and that is being reviewed uh, currently by the Energy Efficiency Advisory Council, which is made up of um, state agency representatives as well as um, industry representatives, advoc advocacy groups. They actually had a meeting, a public meeting today. Um, so a lot of work is being done on improving incentives for electrification and disincentivizing um, any fossil fuel uh, projects and measures. Um, so um, I don't know exactly what the end result will be other than the fact that those incentives will be significantly greater than they have been in the past. Um, 
And so with that, um, it's an exciting time to, to be thinking about this and working on it. And um, as the slide says, we all need to get to work and I'm excited to uh, hear the other presentations and, and address any questions that should come up. Thanks. Oh, thanks so much, Neil. And um, so our next speaker will be um, is up is Bob Zog from the Heat Smart Alliance, um, and he'll go into more detail about heat pumps and what we need to know. Um, over to you, Bob. Okay. Well, thanks, Jim. And if you, can, I'll share my screen here. Excellent. So uh, again, thanks, Jim. I'm Bob Zog with the uh, Heat Smart Alliance, and I'm joined today by Steve Bright, who will help out with uh, Q&A when we get to that point. I'm from Carlisle, and Steve is from Wayland. The Heat Smart Alliance uh, has a mission to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by accelerating the adoption of energy efficient heat pumps in Massachusetts homes and buildings. We're looking at applications of home heating and cooling and also water heating. We're an all volunteer organization. We've got participants from 26 different Massachusetts communities that represents over 270,000 households and we are growing. Our approach is to educate through community events such as this and other means like our website. We also provide one-on-one -on -one coaching to homeowners who wish to consider heat pumps and we collaborate with like-minded organizations. To keep ourselves more objective, we do not accept donations or referral fees from installers or manufacturers. Home heating and cooling is important. Uh, this chart shows the overall energy use in New England, and you can see that fully 30% is associated with uh, residential buildings, and this does not include our transportation or cars. When we break that down, about 61% is for home heating and cooling, 17% for water heating, and about 2% for clothes drying. Those are all applications for which heat pumps can be used. So about 80% of the energy used in our homes could be supplied through heat pumps. So how do we decarbonize our homes? And Neil touched on this a little bit. I mean, step one, weatherize. If you haven't done it recently, Get your free Mass Save Energy audit, and then uh, see what incentives you might be eligible for, and then insulate and air seal your home to the extent practical. You want to reduce the heat loss from your home as much as you can before you invest in a new heating system for your home. Step two is to electrify. That means replacing the equipment that currently burns fossil fuels with high efficiency electric equipment. And that includes heat pumps. And this applies to your transportation as well. You want to switch from a gasoline vehicle to an electric vehicle or at least a plug-in hybrid vehicle uh, as well. And then procure your electricity through re renewable sources. We'll talk a little bit more about that on a later slide. So these steps will lead to major decarbonization of your home. So what is a heat pump? A heat pump is a mechanical device that pumps heat from a cooler place to a warmer place. We all know intuitively that heat naturally flows from warm places to cool places, but if we want to reverse that flow, we have to use a mechanical device and we have to add energy to do it. Now, while we don't call them heat pumps, we have the same basic technology in our homes already. Our refrigerators, our dehumidifiers, our air conditioners are basically using the same technology that a heat pump uses. Heat pumps are available for home heating and cooling, meaning the same device both cools and heats your home. They're available for water heating, they're available for clothes drying, and they're even available for swimming pool heaters. This uh, illustration shows how the efficiency of a heat pump can be greater than 100%. In this example, we're taking one unit of energy from the electric grid we're taking two units of energy from the outdoor air, using a heat pump to put that into the home and we get a net delivery of three units of energy to the home. So that's an efficiency of 300% in this example. And if you're extracting heat from the ground, you can do even better than this. So what are the benefits of heat pumps in Massachusetts homes? Number one, superior comfort 
both summer and winter. Modern heat pumps, the good ones, have variable speed capability, which means instead of operating on, off, on, off, they run at just the right capacity to deliver the heat or the cooling that your home needs. And they run really quietly and they keep a very steady temperature and you hardly know that your air is being heated or cooled. They give you substantial reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and we'll talk more about that. And they can provide energy cost savings as well. Those savings are modest compared to fuel oil, but they can be quite significant compared to propane or electric baseboard. Now, natural gas based on historical prices is still cheaper uh, in terms of a heating fuel. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. And a big benefit is they make your home safer. There's no risk of carbon monoxide poisoning or an explosion from propane or gas. And heat pumps are proven and they're proven in cold climates. I think there was a question in the chat about that. I mean, heat pumps are used in Anchorage, Alaska. So they can heat well, um, even in cold New England temperatures. Now I'm gonna step through a couple of different types of heat pumps just for a brief introduction here. If your home has existing central ductwork, in other words, you have a forced air, warm air heating system, you may be a candidate, you're likely a candidate for a central ducted heat pump. Um, some, in some cases, your ductwork may not be suitable, but a, an installer can evaluate your ductwork and let you know. So the central ducted unit looks a lot like a central air conditioner. You have an outdoor unit, just as you would, although there's, uh, it should be mounted on a pedestal to keep it out of the snow because it's important to keep it uh, above the snow line in the winter. You have an indoor unit that again, looks a lot like what you probably have now with, uh, with your furnace. Uh, another important option is that you can use a ground source heat pump if you have central duct work. And in this case, instead of extracting the heat from the outdoor air, you're extracting the heat from the ground. The ground source heat pump is absolutely the most energy efficient way you can heat and cool your home. And aesthetically, there is no equipment exposed outside. So you don't have any mechanical boxes like this. Everything outdoors is buried. If you don't have ductwork, don't worry. Uh, if you're using hydronic heating or baseboard electric, there are ductless mini splits systems. They can be single or multi-zone. Single zone simply means one outdoor unit mated with one indoor. Multi-zone means there's one outdoor unit mated with multiple indoor units. Now, the big difference that the uh, ductless systems bring here is that they just need a couple of small copper lines that run from the outdoor unit to each indoor unit. So you don't need any duct work, you just connect a couple of lines. Um, they can be, the indoor units can be mounted on a wall, they can re be recessed into the ceiling or they can be mounted on the floor. The ductless systems are inherently a room by room solution. You can heat a single room, you can heat multiple rooms, or you can heat your whole home. So it offers you a lot of options. And let's not forget water heating. Uh, an underappreciated product here is a heat pump water heater, sometimes called a hybrid water heater. And this improves the efficiency of electric water heating by around a factor of three. And they can be extremely economical as well. Neil touched on emissions already. I'll show some similar analysis that we've done, uh, slightly different uh, uh, years and numbers here, but the results are basically similar to what Neil showed you. These are annual emissions for a 2000 square foot typical Massachusetts home. It's based on different types of heating equipment, all using best available efficiency new equipment. You'll note that we're doing comparisons for two years, 2021 and 2040. As Neil pointed out, the uh, Massachusetts electric grid is getting cleaner all the time. So in the future, the emissions associated with electricity are dropping dramatically. And that, what, that's what you see in these differences here for the electric options. As you can see, the heat pump options are 
far better than any of the fossil fuel options in terms of emissions. And even more importantly, if you procure your electricity from 100% renewable sources, these numbers go to zero. Every one of us has access to that, whether we have solar or not. You can buy 100% ele renewable electricity through the grid today. If you happen to be a Westford resident, um, the uh, uh, power options program that you have available, POP, is one way you can do it. If you're in another community, there's other ways to do it, but you can look into that. And uh, whether you go through a community program like Westford POP or whether you do it through uh, National Grid or Eversource, you can get access to 100% renewable electricity today if you choose. So as Neil mentioned, we need to get over a million homes in Massachusetts converted to heat pumps in the next less than 10 years, really. And that's a daunting task. And there's some challenges I'd like to step through uh, here. First, um, I think Jim alluded to this in his opening remarks. Frankly, our heating and cooling equipment lacks sex appeal. People would rather invest in a nice new electric vehicle or put solar panels on the roof. Gives you something to talk about with your neighbors. But we don't really like to think about all that junk in our basement. Two, as I mentioned earlier, we have the complication uh, potentially when you, anytime you look at replacing your heating system, you should think about weatherizing your home. Have you done what you can to get the heating load as low as possible? And if you do need to weatherize, that's another cost and another complication. Now, unfortunately, uh, sometimes installers aren't doing everything they could to really uh, promote heat pumps to their customers. Some installers assume that every customer wants the lowest first cost, and that's what they bid. And they don't necessarily ask customers if they value carbon savings or if they value energy savings over time. Second, quite often, they just quote whatever would replace what you already have without even mentioning that there's an alternative in heat pumps. If they do uh, bid on uh, offer you a heat pump, they sometimes are very conservative at uh, leaving in the old fossil fuel system and just using the heat pump in very moderate temperatures instead of really using the full range that modern heat pumps can uh, provide heat during. And to illustrate this a bit, um, we're showing a chart here where we plot swap over temperature. And this simply means at what temperature is your heat pump programmed to shut off and then your fossil fuel backup system to come on. Um, many installers based on our experience will set that temperature around 32 Fahrenheit. And what this chart shows is at 32 Fahrenheit, you're capturing maybe 55% of your overall seasonal heating load with a heat pump. And you're leaving 45% for your backup system. If instead you set it just 12 degrees lower, suddenly you're capturing 85 to 90% of your seasonal heating load with a heat pump. So a substantial improvement in decarbonizing by going to this lower swap over temperature. And there's no reason that a reasonably well-insulated home, uh, reasonably well-air-sealed home, uh, shouldn't be able to achieve uh, a displacement of at least 80% or maybe 100% of their heating load with heat pumps and just using a backup system on rare occasion. Okay, getting back to the cost of natural gas, that's the last of the four uh, challenges we'll cover tonight. Based on historical prices in the last couple of years, natural gas is cheaper in terms of operating costs than uh, air source heat pumps and only marginally better than ground source right now. So this is a barrier. We're not pricing uh, these fuels based on their environmental impacts. And that's what you see happening here. Um, Remember though, these are historical prices and they don't represent what you care about, which is what's gonna happen in the next 10, 15 or 20 years after I buy the heat pump. And to that point, 
there are experts that are now projecting substantial increases in natural gas prices, not just for this winter, but for future seasons as well. So these numbers could change quite a bit as soon as this winter. So what should your action plan be? Number one, don't wait for your current system to fail. If either your heating system or your cooling system is more than 15 years old, now is the time to think about what you want to do to replace it. If you wait until that equipment fails, you could be faced with an emergency replacement situation and you may not have time to evaluate alternatives. And if you install an air conditioner or a fossil fuel heating system, you've then locked in your home for another 15 or 20 years and you won't have the ability to easily decarbonize uh, your heating and cooling. And certainly if you'd like to add air conditioning to your home and you don't currently have it, heat pumps are an excellent way to both heat and cool. And certainly if you're planning an addition, a major renovation, or certainly in a new home, a heat pump can provide up to 100% of your heating and cooling needs. And certainly those applications uh, are probably the uh, easiest to uh, use heat pumps. To get started, there's a fair bit of information available on the Heat Smart Alliance website at heatsmartalliance.org. We also have links to a lot of other sources that we think you'll find very helpful, including information on incentives and uh, guidelines for asking questions of installers. And as I mentioned earlier, get your free mass save home energy assessment and then weatherize to the maximum extent practical and get help from your community heating coach. Now I have to be cautious here. The Heat Smart Alliance has eight coaches to cover the entire uh, state. So it's done on an as available basis, but we do try to accommodate uh, requests for coaching as we can. And we do suggest that you get at least two or three quotes from qualified installers. You may have to approach four or five installers to get two or three quotes. But every home is unique, every situation is a little different, and one installer may see um, something that another installer misses. So we generally find it's very helpful to get, uh, get a few quotes. And that's all I have. I look forward to uh, addressing questions with Steve's help uh, uh, after we get through the next few presentations. Well, thanks so much, Bob. That was really helpful. All right, let me, and like Bob says, we'll, um, if you could hold on to your questions to the end, we'll, uh, we'll have some time to go over some of these questions. So our next, uh, our next speaker tonight um, is Tom Teller. He's a Westford resident. We'll talk about his experience with heat pumps, uh, heat pump mini splits in his home. Um, hi, Tom. Hey, Jim. I hear you. Okay, good. All right. Shall I get started? Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you, Jim, and good evening, all. Um, it's my pleasure to speak with you this morning to share our experience this past year, all four seasons, with our mini split heat pump system. Next slide. This is our home. It's a mid 19th century farmhouse, very compact, four bedrooms on two floors, just over 2,000 square feet. And that includes 800 square feet we added in 1988. The pre-existing heating system was an oil furnace. It's beyond its expected service life. And the single heating zone was served by old ductwork, which was deemed marginal for heating and unworkable for central cooling. We did have several window AC units we used in the bedrooms in the summer aided by ceiling fans in each bedroom, uh, but we had neither on the first floor, just a couple of box fans. Next, please. Before we got started, uh, we did take several steps as has been recommended in several of the presentations tonight to make our home ready. We had some mass save uh, energy audits completed and we implemented the several recommendations that resulted from those audit, audits, and we enjoyed uh, generous financial support from MassSave for several of those. 
I really shouldn't have included the pictures on this slide in the presentation. It looks like a lunar landscape. I, I, I do get a chuckle out of it, I have to admit. But it does illustrate both the blown in insulation added to our attic and the effectiveness of the draft caps that were installed that made it hard for me to get any picture at all. In addition, we replaced all of our single glazed windows, both those original to the home and the inexpensive wood windows we installed when we built the addition 35 years ago. And in addition, we replaced the similarly single glazed rear entry door. We also had a, a mass save audit conducted just prior to beginning the project I'm talking about tonight to ensure that our preparations were complete, to ensure eligibility for mass save rebates, and to qualify for a zero interest heat loan to provide funding for the project. Let's move on to the heat pump project again. Next, please, Jim. I know there are a lot of words on this slide, but I wanted to set a good baseline. It's important when installing a heat pump to make sure that the system fits both your goals and the house. As clearly stated above, our primary goal was to make our home sustainably comfortable in all seasons to improve energy efficiency and to reduce CO2 emissions. In addition, after living with a single zone system for 35 years, we wanted multiple zones for comfort and efficiency. We sought to offset the substantial investment required by avoiding the cost of replacing the current system and by qualifying for rebates and tax credits. And we financed the balance with a zero interest heat loan. We sought to improve the potential resale value of our home by preserving its character while updating it with state-of-the-art sustainable systems. It's important to emphasize that we intended that the new system serve as the sole source of heating and cooling. We did retain the existing furnace as a backup. We were confident, but we lacked experience, so we retained the furnace as a backup. The poor condition of our ductwork dictated a mini split system type of heat pump. After a bit of shopping around, we worked with and obtained quotes from three well-qualified HVAC installers. Next slide, Jim. Here is an overview of the project layout as discussed in depth with each of the installers. The first floor has an open layout allowing natural circulation. As highlighted in green, we spend most of our time in the family room, kitchen, and dining room for meals. Upstairs, there are four bedrooms. The focal points are the master bedroom and the guest bedroom, which is my work from home office. And the other bedrooms are used by our son and grandchildren who live with us part time. For our home, next slide, please. For our home, we chose to install a Mitsubishi Hyperheat mini split system working with Lamco Systems Inc. of Tingsboro. They're a Mitsubishi Diamond preferred contractor and their designer analyzed both the heat, heating and cooling requirements of our home. And here in New England, it's invariably the heating requirements that drive the design and considered both where we spend the most time in the house and the orientation of the home. The final design was for two parallel systems, one serving the family room and master bedroom and that's shown in the picture on the left, system one, and the other serving the living room, dining room, kitchen, and three bedrooms labeled system two on the right. Next slide, please. Here is the as-built highlights for the first floor. The two outside compressor condenser units were positioned at the rear corners of the house, both for appearance and to facilitate short runs of the conduit that houses the wiring, refrigerant lines, and condensate drains required. The first floor is supplied by two wall-mounted heads positioned on opposite sides of the home to take advantage of the natural circulation of the open plan arrangement, and that's worked out well. Next slide, please. Upstairs, the system is served, the master bedroom is served by its own wall-mounted head, very much like the ones downstairs. And the other bedrooms are each served by a single, single ceiling cassette that fits neatly between the ceiling joists of the room and they're supplied from the attic. Next slide, please. So how has it worked out? Well, in short, it's been quite wonderful. 
The system has been trouble free and met our very high expectation. The system kept all rooms warm and snug all winter, even on the very coldest days. I'll share with you a few days ago, my wife Emily remarked to me that despite the beauty of autumn in New England, she always dreaded this time of year as it meant that winter was around the corner and she would be cold. But she told me this year she was content because she knew that despite the, whatever the winter throws at us, she would be warm and comfortable in our home. The system also did a great job this past summer, keeping us cool and comfortable even on the hottest days and relieved the long stretch of very humid days and nights, I might add. Each inside head has its own remote that fits in a wall-mounted cradle. That's the beige picture at the center bottom. It, it, it hangs in the cradle, cradle, but it can be moved to wherever you are. I will tell you that invariably, we control the system using the excellent Kumo Cloud smartphone app as pictured at the lower right. We can control each room from virtually anywhere. The picture on the left is the home screen uh, that lists all the systems and the, the picture at right is an example of one room and the controls available. And in this case, it's a master bedroom. Each of the head also has its dedicated own dedicated temperature humidity sensor. So a little one inch square puck as shown next to the remote in the bottom center picture. Next slide. So here's how things have worked out in terms of cost. For this analysis, I tracked all energy usage of our home for the past four years. I averaged the prior three years and compared the three year average to this past year where we were operating the heat pump. As you can see, the calculation was we achieved a 19% reduction in cost compared to the three year average. That's adjusted for deg degree days and, and noting that last winter was slightly warmer than the average for the last three years, a little bit under 5% reduction in heating degree days. But that 19% re reflects uh, the adjustment for those uh, the slightly warmer winter. This comparison really understates the savings though, because the electrical cost for this past year also included the cost of recharging our Subaru plug-in hybrid, uh, pictured it right, and it also reflects the extra few penny, pennies we spend for each kilowatt hour to take advantage of the 100% renewable option in the Westford Pop Gold option. Um, which has been mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. More importantly, our aggregate heating and cooling carbon footprint was virtually eliminated. After an initial adjustment period, while we tweaked the set points, uh, the so-called crossover temperature, when the furnace would kick in if needed to keep the house warm, we actually used no oil at all not a drop. The mini splits kept the warm, the house warm and cozy and did not struggle at all to achieve that comfort, comfort, even in the coldest days of the winter. Next slide, last slide. So that's our story. I thank you for your time. And back to you, Jim. Oh, thank you, Tom. Okay, now um, next we have Paul Morse, um, a Westford resident, who has some tips for us on what to consider when purchasing a heat pump for your home. Hi, Paul. Hi, Jim. Can you hear me? I can. Good. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Paul Morse, a longtime resident of Westford. At this point, you've heard uh, from Neil about the state's 2050 net zero mandate and the need to green the grid and electrify our homes. Bob told us about how heat pumps work and their environmental and cost benefits. And you just heard from Tom about a properly installed mini split heat pump system works as advertised and provides an economical, eco-friendly uh, year round comfort. Now I'm gonna focus on a homeowner steps that we took to research and prepare and select a central ducted heat pump solution for our home. It has not been installed yet. We have committed to it over the summer 
but because of some supply chain issues, it won't be installed probably until November. But nonetheless, the steps that we took, I think will be uh, applicable to most of the audience that are listening tonight. Next, uh, next slide, Jim, please. So if you have central duct work, and by the way, a majority of folks in Westford do have central duct work, uh, a cold climate air source heat pump is now a very viable, low cost, eco-friendly way to heat and cool your home, as you've heard in the previous uh, presentation. Our house, for context here, you can see a picture of our house, which is a little under 2,500 square, square foot. It's a two-story classic garrison colonial built in 1984. We have central ducted oil furnace with a conventional AC system. And it turns out that um, one of the drivers for us in considering this is that it's a 20 year old system. So it's reaching the end of its useful life as Bob had indicated earlier is a, is a, is a good point to consider the upgrade to a heat pump. We also had some experience with heat pumps because our hot water system is an air source unit and it's cut electricity bills by about 30%. So significant savings. We use about 750 gallons of oil per year. So that's about eight tons of CO2 emissions per year. And we also have solar panels. So we've been motivated for several years now to reduce our carbon footprint. So when we embarked on this, uh, um, this, this process, we considered multiple heating, ventilation, and air conditioning options. One was an all electric central air source heat pump system that's been described by Bob. Another was the hybrid air source heat pump with a backup oil furnace. In our instance, we had the, we had the apparatus and the infrastructure for the oil furnace and the, the oil tank and so forth. So a viable backup for us would be an oil furnace. I also looked at an all electric geothermal heat pump, but the cost quite frankly was prohibitive. Now maybe with the new mass save incentive programs, and maybe those incentives will change with geothermal, but that remains to be seen. We also looked at a conventional AC oil furnace system but that carbon footprint was simply too high for our consideration. We selected option two, which is the hybrid dual fuel system. And we've uh, selected a Bosch five ton cold climate certified air source heat pump with a high efficiency oil furnace as a backup. We expect that our crossover temperature will be in the neighborhood of 20 degrees Fahrenheit as Bob alluded to, that's gonna be likely to save us as much as 90% a year on our, on our oil use. We also are using a smart thermostat, which allows us to integrate that crossover point and allows us to make adjustments of, for comfort uh, in the house. And after rebates, um, the overall system is in the neighborhood of $10,000. So it's a very cost competitive solution. Uh, next slide, Bob, uh, uh, Jim. So the first thing I'll tell you as you get into this is that the, the jargon can be very confusing. There's a lot of mumbo jumbo, a lot of new terms that you'll bump into but do use installers and coaches and online resources that can help you. I simply wanna point out a couple here. Uh, one I'll call TON, T-O-N, TON. The first you think of it, that's the weight of the unit. And it turns out that's a historical or an antique artifact of the way people sized and, and uh, constructed um, refrigeration way back in the turn of the 20th century. And it refers to the amount of heat required to melt one ton of ice in a 24 hour period. So often you'll hear units described as one ton, two ton, three ton, five ton. In our instance, I mentioned it's five ton. I also point out a couple, uh, highlight a couple other parameters that Mass Save uses to determine whether your unit will be qualified for incentive rebates. So do, do pay attention to those particular parameters which are uh, associated with um, performance factors like heating season performance factor or seasonal performance factors, uh, capacity ratios between different temperatures and the like. 17 and 47 are, are particularly um, important in terms of establishing a cold climate certified system that works properly at low temperature. Uh, next uh, slide, Jim, please. Now here's a schematic of our house. And as I mentioned, it's, a central, it's going to be a central air source heat pump with a backup furnace using our existing ducts. And it has three essential components. Uh, there'll be a, the, the smarts of the system are outside the Bosch five ton cold climate heat pump has a compressor and all the variable speed apparatus. And that's on the outside shown on the left of the house. Um, the inside unit uh, consists of a heat pump coil along mounted on top of the oil furnace itself. So it's a stacked arrangement. It's a tight configuration. And once we made the decision to have a backup unit using oil, 
It limited our choice and range of options in terms of manufacturers and configurations. Um, nonetheless, there are multiple, probably dozens of manufacturers that make cold climate certified air source heat pumps for uh, central ducted systems. I also mentioned that we have, uh, we have a single zone house and we're using an Echo B smart thermostat and uh, for programmable crossover points and over owner overrides for comfort. We, we on our house have snow, uh, solar panels on the back of our house. That's where our uh, existing uh, conventional uh, AC unit is. But because of snow drop from the so solar panels, it restricts the location of the outdoor unit of the heat pump to be elsewhere. And so it, in, an, in an indirect way, the solar panels dry the location and the distance between the, the uh, equipment in the house. But a dual fuel system can be used in either electric, oil, or gas backup mode. And it's interesting to note that about 70% or so of Westford's uh, residents uh, use gas as opposed to oil. Uh, next slide, please. Now this is a, some pictures of, uh, of the unit that we'll having installed. Uh, they have very similar physical characteristics or footprints to conventional heating and AC units. You can see on the left, that's the outdoor heat pump. It looks very similar to a typical uh, outdoor unit for a conventional AC. I mentioned it's a five ton heat pump, but that unit is only 220 pounds, just to give you, a, you know, the uh, confusion factor in terms of the, uh, the units that people are measuring. Uh, you do have to keep it clean, keep the snow off it for maximum efficiency. I note that the indoor heat pump coil unit will sit on top of the oil furnace, which has a variable speed blower. Um, and that stack up height is, was a, a con major consideration in terms of what manufacturer uh, had available equipment that could fit our constraints in terms of the physical geometry and size of the uh, indoor footprint of our system. And I show on the right uh, an Echo B smart thermostat single zone control with will set an, at the outset at 20 degrees Fahrenheit. We will, we will experiment, with, experiment with that over the, over the seasons. Uh, next slide, Jim, please. Now, the first thing you should do, and I think it was highlighted by Bob, is to get the Mass Save Energy Audit and get the weatherization uh, uh, incentives that they provide. We did that over the summer um, and they provided um, a 16 inch blown insulation as Tom had shown you. Uh, they provided heat caps and door seals and they reduced the air loss in the house by 25%. So we we're already ahead of the game in terms of the efficiency of the house. And we were able to, we were able to quickly see that efficiency as measured by, um, think of it as miles per gallon of fuel efficiency, but it actually increased by about 10% and we only provided coverage of insulation about 50 to 60% of our, of our attic because we wanted to use the space for storage. Um, we got this work done for free because they were trying to restart their vendor base during the pandemic. This, the value of what they did was about $4,500. It's typically a 75% subsidy. So there was a big cost savings here and a, and a major incentive uh, to get this kind of work done before you go and install uh, high value equipment like an air source heat pump. Next slide, please. Now, um, the Mass Save program has a number of incentives and they have a, a um, I'd say an extra incentive on uh, eliminating oil. It's something that Bob had a slide early on about how oil is the dirtiest of fuels that uh, heat our homes. And the fact that we had a legacy oil system made us a prime candidate to take advantage of various incentives that. Uh, Mass Save had to, had to offer if you in fact use a qualified cold climate certified air source heat pump. And that's exactly what we did. So we actually get rebates in terms of the smart programmable thermostat. We get a large uh, rebate per ton uh, of uh, uh, cooling capacity of the, heat, of the um, five ton air source heat pump. We, there actually is still an incentive baked into the system to um, replace existing oil furnaces with high efficiency, uh, energy star rated uh, furnaces. So we're actually gonna get a, a, a rebate for the furnace itself and as a federal tax credit. So you take a, the advantage of the mass save for incentives for weatherization and add it into the equipment rebate program. It's over $11,000 in savings that we anticipate with this conversion that we're about to do. So that's significant. Uh, next slide, please. So there are many factors to consider. And one of the major ones is selecting the right installer. And the first step is to get smart. And that's to talk to people like Bob Zog and HeatSmart Alliance 
But there's lots of resources online, uh, Mass CEC, Clean Energy Center, the Mass Save program itself, uh, NEEP, which is the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership, has a lot of a wealth of information and a lot of uh, uh, technical specifications and test data associated with each and every cold climate certified heat pump. So uh, it, it's in your interest to go and look at some of these online resources, but do talk to a number of suppliers and, and installer feedback. There's a lot of there's a lot of installers out there at the moment. Um, and they'll provide a wide range of experiences and, and suggestions, and it's worth talking to several before you make your decisions. I would say watch out for sales brochure or performance specs. Uh, it may not correspond to the actual performance as installed, and uh, they often are overselling or marketing through their brochure. So you want to look at the actual measured characteristics that are provided by NEEP. Um, so take a look at that. Um, Develop a set of specific questions to ask each installer. So you have sort of a conventional common frame of reference that you're asking each one of them. You'll get a different answer probably from each based on their experience. Ask it whether they'll help you uh, complete the forms for the rebate and incentives. Ask them what method they use for size the system. Do they use a rule of thumb? Do they use uh, software? Do they use calculations? Do they use more rigorous analysis? And I did ask for that as part of our um, um, research. I asked for a very sophisticated analysis of a home and only one of the installers was willing to do that for us. So that made the difference. Ask them where they'll locate that outdoor unit. As I mentioned, there may be issues associated with your form factory of your home or how snow falls that you might want to move that equipment elsewhere. Uh, next and final slide. So uh, there were a number of factors associated with our selection. We talked to five area uh, HVAC installers. They all expressed interest. They all visited our home uh, to survey the site and discuss options. There was a wide range of experience and interest in heat, in heat pumps. Some were more familiar with them than others. A number of them were actually certified trained uh, installers for several different uh, manufacturers. But after all five had come through, only two provided bids. And I think that's probably consistent with other people's experiences. These folks are busy. Uh, they have various reasons for selecting the people they want to work with. We ultimately selected Wilson Brothers and Pepperell. They asked all the right questions in terms of understanding our needs. Uh, they had experience with multiple manufacturers, so they weren't just pushing the Bosch Granby pair. But they that Bosch Granby pair um, was recommended by three of the five vendors. So we knew we had uh, we knew we had. Um, the right solution in front of us. They had knowledgeable trained staff and they had firsthand experience in installing the exact equipment that was proposed. So the bottom line up front out of pocket cost was is 16,700 change. And the net cost after the rebate is just a little under a shade under 10K. So um, all in all, um, you know, it's a, we had the advantage of time because we were not in an emergency mode as Bob had alluded to. If you're in an emergency mode, you may not have the equipment uh, options that you think you do, um, and you may be forced to take a non-optimized uh, configuration as a result. So think about it, look and see what your range of options are, how old your equipment is, and, uh, and I suggest that it's, uh, it's, it's certainly a timely uh, and uh, important step to take in terms of the uh, climate crisis challenge. And with that, I'm all done. Turn it back over to you, Jim. Okay. Thanks so much, Paul. You can just stay online here because we're going to go now at this point over to the question and answers. And um, and I have to say kind of just going, and that was terrific, Paul. I really appreciate that. Um, going over the chat, I have to say that there's a, there's a lot of informed residents in there um, that have some experience with e-pumps, that they've been answering some of the questions as we go. And, and I guess as I start going through the questions, I know some of them looking at ones at the beginning, I think were eventually covered when Bob made his presentation talking about differences between air source and ground source heat pumps and that, and that like. But one question here at the beginning of which I thought was kind of interesting was, um, and I don't know if I got Neil on here, but is there was a, the point about we need to do uh, over a million conversions over the next you know 10 years. You know, are there enough installers out there to do the, all these conversions? Are there enough heat pumps out there? And I, I don't know if any one of our panelists here would like to maybe speak to that. Um, you know, maybe that's a good problem to have if we did. Bob, would you want to take that maybe until uh, if you had something to say there? Sure, I'll, uh, 
I'll start and then Neil can fill in. Um, I don't have a complete answer to that question. I can say based on the communities in which the Heat Smart Alliance has members, uh, heat pumps have been going in at a rate of maybe 1% of the homes in our communities are putting in heat pumps each year, something like that. Um, that rate has to go way up to meet uh, the state goals. And I don't, I'm not sure if it's a factor of five or a factor of 10, but it's a huge increase. Um, now keep in mind installers would be putting in less fossil fuel equipment and more heat pumps. So the ones who do both need to shift, but they may be able to accommodate. But uh, yeah, I don't know, uh, but that's a, it is a step, step up in the market for sure. So I'll just add, um... It's a great question. Um, I mean, the, the if if there were demand for a hundred thousand installations tomorrow, then that would be problematic. <laughs> um, but I, I should mention that part of the legislation. Um, this is Neil, by the way. Part of the legislation um, really requires um, workforce development, and that's part of what the program administrators are incentivizing now. So. Um, it's to build that capacity up over the next couple of years. So there's certainly, as the other presentations demonstrated, there are certainly qualified installers throughout the state, but it is an issue that we need to invest in as well um, in order to expand that knowledge base and even to um, increase the knowledge of the existing installers, because as as was mentioned, even the existing experienced installers um, are not as likely to um, suggest heat pumps as we would hope um, in most cases. So that's why organizations like Heat Smart Alliance are so important. Um, uh, and I'm just looking at this question that I'm on asking if the mass save rebates will be significantly greater for heat pumps um, they will be greater. I don't know what the definition of significant <laughs> is. Um, as I mentioned, there, there was a public meeting today from the advisory council and essentially the, the program administrators of MassSave, which are the um, utilities, submitted a draft plan. They're required to submit a three-year efficiency plan. Um, and that three-year plan is up now, which is which describes how they're going to meet their targets. And so they submitted a draft plan in April. Um, and at that point, they were given feedback, which basically said, do better on electrification and equity and a whole bunch of other areas. They came back in September with a new plan, which is significantly better and more robust in all those areas. But um, from the meeting that I was part of today, I would say that there's still work to do. And I can't tell you I really can't provide or speculate on like, will they be double or 30% more or 20% more? But I will say that air source heat pump incentives are going up and fossil fuel incentives are going down. Um, and eventually I think it's safe to say that the fossil fuel incentives will start to go away. I'll also just mention that weatherization and building envelope incentives and investments are also going up in this next three year plan. Oh, thanks so much, Neil. Um, another question here actually um, said that I have a central AC unit. Is there an advantage to heat pump for cooling? Um, is there an efficiency um, advantage to that, I guess, is the question. Um, does someone want to take that, Bob or Steve? Or? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll take a stab at that. Um, if you have uh, an older air conditioner, almost for sure the heat pump will be more efficient for cooling than your current air conditioning unit. And it's likely to also provide much more comfortable air conditioning in your current unit as well. But again, the big benefit of going to a heat pump is to get the decarbonization that you achieve during the winter months. Uh, most of the energy we use is for heating in this part of the country rather than cooling. But uh, in terms of comfort, I think in most cases, you'll see a big step up when you go to a modern heat pump. Thanks, Bob. Um, another question here actually is interesting too is, um, 
you know, now that we convert everything over to uh, to running on electricity, um, someone comments here that I've had two three-day power outages in 2020, electric power outages. Um, how can I completely depend on the electrical grid? Um, anybody want to take that or? Uh, Paul here, if, can you hear me? I can. I, um, that was one of the factors that was a prime consideration for our location in Westford. We lose power. I would say fairly regularly for a variety of different reasons. And I have a, actually have a gas, a portable gas generator that I use to run my furnace now. So it was important to me and it was one of the deciding factors to, to have this backup capability with an oil furnace that I don't want to use except for extreme conditions, but I, I wanted to have the ability to heat my house in the event of a power outage. And I couldn't convince myself that I could do that with a standard all electrics configuration. It normally would take 15 kilowatts of power, and I simply don't have a generator capacity that would handle that. So that's one of the factors that was a deciding factor for Paul and um, in our situation to uh, go with a hybrid unit. But also keep in mind um, that conventional fossil fuel equipment requires electricity too for the controls, the pumps, the blowers and whatnot. So if you don't have a backup generator and the power goes out, even with a fossil fuel system, you don't have heat. And as Paul just said, the difference would be you might be able to get away with a smaller generator um, with fossil fuel than you would with, with a heat pump. But another big advantage of weatherizing is that weatherizing improves your resilience in the case of a power outage. In other words, your heat will, your, your home will lose heat far more slowly a really well-constructed home built today can go four or five days <laughs> after uh, losing heat. You know, you certainly you're going to, the house will cool off, but it will cool off uh, much, much more slowly than uh, an older house that's not well insulated. Uh, one thing I was going to add to that too would be that um, if you have solar panels and uh, go into some kind of battery backup, like a Tesla Firewall or something along those lines, you yeah. there are ways to almost get yourself completely off the grid and heat your house for free, essentially by using your solar electricity for that heat. So um, um, there's lots of options out there nowadays, I think, than just going to a generator necessarily. Um, another question came in was about um, loans, um, and I don't know if someone else touched on this already, but you know, are there loans out there available to help with this transition? Um, you know, um, there was something like a heat loan, I think, that maybe Mass Save supported. I'm, I'm not too sure about that. Yeah, this is uh, Steve Bright. Yeah, Mass Saves off offers an interest-free heat loan. I think today it's uh, up to maybe uh, twenty-five thousand dollars. Um, that can be used toward the uh, cost of the heat pump. It currently does not cover uh, upgrades. Uh, often when you put in a heat pump, you, your home may need a, a electrical, electrical panel upgrade from 100 amps to 200 amps, and that cost cannot be um, financed with the loan. But uh, I also attended the EAC meeting today with the review of the new mass safe plan and they are planning to allow coverage by the loans of the electrical panel upgrade in the future. Oh, thanks, Stephen. I guess that would be a question too about electrical upgrades. Did someone touch on that already? Um, that some homes may need additional electrical work um, to have a heat pump installed or? Yeah, I, I, I would guess that in Westford, your, most of your homes probably already have 200 amp service. Um, in areas, uh, you know, older homes may just have 60 amp or 100 amp service, and then it's uh, necessary to upgrade the electrical panel. And from my experience, the cost for a electrical panel upgrade is in the range of two to three thousand uh, dollars. But if you're also looking at an electric car, that may be something you need to do anyway. Oh, that's true. Thanks, Stephen. Um, there's another question here about maintenance uh, that they've been getting. One person here said they've gotten different, different information from different vendors about recommended uh, yearly maintenance. And it, this might apply more to the mini splits. Um, I'm not sure they don't say here, but um, can anyone speak to that about um, how often you have to maintain your heat pump or? 
Yeah, I'll uh, I'll start, but I think Tom uh, would like to be unmuted as well, so he can he can pitch in here. Um, yeah, I mean, I would certainly manufacturers have uh, recommended maintenance. I think most of them would recommend yearly maintenance. Um, not unlike your furnace or air conditioner or boiler today. Uh, some people argue that maintenance is not necessary. Uh, I guess if you skip the maintenance on your heat pump, you're not risking carbon monoxide poisoning. You're not risking fire and explosion like you might with a, with a furnace or boiler. So in that sense, you might be able to skip it. But you could, you could have a problem that you don't discover and, and be losing efficiency. Uh, so it's not a bad idea to follow the recommended uh, maintenance intervals. I am not, however, familiar with uh, a requirement for twice a year maintenance on a heat pump. I'm not saying it's, it's not out there, I, 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 but I would ask questions about why that would be necessary. <clears throat> Jim? Yep, Tom, gotcha. I would know that on our particular system, we've had it now for a year, uh, each of the inside head units has a filter, which we clean regularly, and, and that's important to maintain their efficiency. Um, the, both the manufacturer of the system and our installer uh, reckon, recommended a once a year checkup, but there's not really anything. It, it's just literally to come out and check to make sure everything's working properly. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, one person just directed uh, direct message me, basically saying that one thing we want to make sure we emphasize here that we that you know there's many different types of heat pumps, but the one of the keys is that you need to definitely get a uh, cold climate um, air source heat pump. But that's and I think that was emphasized, but um, maybe that's just worth uh, mentioning again. And that uh, and also that there's uh, some uh, some particular list here, NEEP. CCASP list, um, I guess, which has to do maybe with rebates and stuff. Um, is that correct, Bob? Um, actually, the oh, rebates, uh, sorry, this is Steve Bright. Uh, on the rebates, the uh, mass save on, and we kind of wish that they would just use the NEEP cold climate heat pump list, but mass save has its own list of heat pumps that qualify for rebates. And all of the heat pumps on mass saves lists are cold climate heat pumps as far as I know. So, so you have to make sure that uh, when you get a quote from an installer, some installers will uh, tell you what the rebate is and they'll even file for the rebate on your behalf. Uh, that's probably the easiest way to do it. But if you're filing on your own, make sure to check with MassSafe before you sign the uh, installer's agreement to that that the system you're buying qualifies for that mass save rebate. Uh, just a, a, a point here, uh, Jim, is that I, I uh, looked at both the NEEP and the uh, mass save list. And one of the uh, common uh, conventions they use is what's called the AHRI number. So like a nine digit nomenclature, a number for any, any configuration. And there are thousands of configurations, by the way, and dozens and dozens of manufacturers with a sort of a uniform code that's used to identify uniquely a configuration. And once and you wanna make sure that your installer or the bid that you receive has that number because it allows you to do some uh, investigation in terms of what NEEP characteristics, uh, test characteristics there are or what the cold, uh, the cold climate air source heat pump qualified parts list from uh, Mass Save is. The number is useful in digging into those different databases. So make sure that they provide you that, uh, that number. Oh, thanks, Paul. Actually, there's a the question here for you, Paul, actually, that came out and that said, um, you estimated in your, your, your presentation that the crossover temperature will be about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And he said, um, how did you make this estimate? Um, well, that's an interesting question. And there was, a, I had a, um, remember, I have the luxury of a little bit of time. I'm not in an emergency mode. So I asked the installer whether he would run what was called a manual J calculation, which is a computer-based calculation that takes into account rigorously your house form factor, windows, um, how tight it is, and the, you know your internal characteristics of your home. And it produces a detailed uh, report on um, heat load, 
and it matches that heat load up against heat, the heat capacity of the unit you're buying. And they, th that analysis allows you to, to um, project a crossover point. And in my instance, it was projected to be 14 degrees Fahrenheit, but I'm setting it a little cautiously at 20 because uh, I want to make sure that uh, I'm comfortable. But the number was actually rigorously calculated by a, a third, an independent third party source. Thanks, Paul. Um, I have a question here too that says, um, I'm thinking of electrifying an aging oil fired hydronic heating system. Um, any any uh, recommendations, I guess is what they're asking. Well, the typical uh, route to take, and again, it's important that you get installers into your home to advise you. We're just making generality, general comments here. But that's uh, typically a case where you might look at the ductless uh, mini split or multi split solutions. And whether you go uh, with a single mini split system to heat maybe your largest room or whether you go with a, uh, a more elaborate system will, will depend on you and the configuration of your home. But that's usually the way you would uh, you'd approach it. There are, there are some other solutions, but they're probably more expensive and more complicated. Thanks, Bob. Um, still some questions here about the mass save rebates. Um, I think, Neil, you spoke to this, but um, people still looking at like, what should they be waiting for 2022 essentially for to see what's coming or? I, I know I could speak to this personally that like I, I have a central gas furnace myself. And uh, if you go to mass save, they there are no um, mass save incentives right now to go from a, a gas furnace to a heat pump. Um, so uh, I'm hoping to see that change in the new year. Um, someone asked about, in terms of mini splits, and maybe Tom, you can answer to this, is that they've had a quote for, uh, they have a four bedroom home, and then we're gonna do mini splits and have two of the rooms without any um, mini splits. Or do you have to leave your doors open in the winter to get the heat to circulate or how does that work? Well, in, in our case, we wanted to have individual units in each of the four bedrooms, and we do. Uh, that was partly driven by comfort, and it was partly driven by the fact that two of the bedrooms are only used part-time. Um, and so we wanted to be able to close off those rooms, uh, set them to a you know, much cooler temperature, and so uh, to, to minimize the the, the cost of the overall heat. Much of the winter, um, we've been able to leave the heat in those rooms completely off without any problem. And most of the time, um, we, we do tend to keep our bedroom doors closed. Um, convection happens, right? <laughs> and so what we find is in cold weather temperatures, the uh, family room, which is at the foot of the stairs, is nice and warm and the heat flows upstairs and into the master bedroom if we keep the door wide open. Um, and so we, it, we've made some adjustments to the way that we, we uh, have our doors set. Downstairs, the air circulates naturally all around and the heat distributes, it, as, I, as I mentioned, it's a very open plan. And that's by um, like just the way that we, we laid out the house and that's worked very well for the heat pump. So we have just the two heads downstairs. Thanks, Tom. Um, someone's asking here that they have a small five room ranch. Uh, would a single unit, I guess a mini split, uh, be sufficient? And I mean, I guess, Bob, you kind of say these things, we can, we, we can only make general comments here. You probably need to get an expert to come in, but uh, does that sound like something that they would probably need multiple units? Um, well, it's one of those depends. I mean, I, I think if you have a small ranch, uh, depending on how well insulated it is, depending on how the rooms are laid out and all that, uh, you might be able to do a lot with a single mini split. You may, be, may not be able to heat every room equally well, but you may find you can do quite a bit. And what some installers suggest is that you start out with a single mini split with one indoor unit. Um, and then if you find you like it and you want to uh, heat and cool other rooms that aren't getting adequately heated or cooled with that system, 
then you can add more uh, more heat pumps later. So that's one approach. And of course, you keep your current heating system to heat the rooms that aren't being adequately heated with a heat pump. It's not you're not going to be freezing. Thanks, Bob. Uh, there's a question here for Tom. Um, you installed rigid foam under the outside sidings. Did you have an estimate of how much this would reduce your overall home heat load before you did it? And I get this kind of goes maybe to the, um, the, the point earlier about that one of the first steps you do before you actually go down this heat pump, uh, heat pump path is to actually insulate your home well. Um, um, we didn't have a separate estimate of that. And uh, quite honestly, the rigid foam insulation that we added to the outside was part, partly for air sealing and, and partly as a good foundation for the new exterior side of the siding that we put on the house. So, you know, I, I wouldn't, it, it, the, the cost as a part of the project, you know, resizing the house was minimal. And I, I, I honestly couldn't speak to how much insulation value uh, that layer of rigid foam added to the outside of the house. It was mainly for other reasons. The additional insulation was sort of a, and you know, we got a little bit of this additional insulation for it. Um, we had some air seal issues. Uh, the windows addressed most of those and the, uh, the rigid foam insulation did the rest. Uh, I did see a, a question go by that I, I want to re respond to. And um, we worked a lot with the set points and <clears throat> We didn't have a full manual J analysis done. Um, we we uh, used our operating experience as we went along. Our installer said that if we wanted to be conservative when we installed the system, we could start it as a set the uh, crossover temperature at 20 Fahrenheit. That would be the temperature which the oil furnace kicked on. Um, we we didn't find that that was necessary and we lowered it in five degree increments. And so that all, well, the majority of last winter after the first few weeks, the uh, crossover temperature was set at zero degrees Fahrenheit. The system is rated to maintain full capacity to five degrees and operate to minus 13. And that worked very well. Um, so the, and our, the unit we installed does not have any electric resistance supplemental uh, build into it. Thanks, Tom. Um, there's a question here about radiant heating, radiant and baseboard heat. Um, that that's what they have in their home, and is uh, are there options for a heat pump? And uh, I know we've talked a lot about air source heat pumps, but I have heard also of an air source um, water heat pump or one that uses maybe water on the inside of the home to move heat around. Um, can someone speak to that? Yeah, I can speak to that briefly, uh, although uh, now when someone says they have a radiant heating system, uh, I'll assume for the sake of this question, it's a floor radiant heating system, or it may or may not be. Um, so there is something, uh, they're not very common, and there's relatively few installers, but there are installers in the area who can put in a air to water heat pump. So that would be taking heat from the outdoor air, but putting it into a hydronic heating system. The trick here is that the hydronic heating system needs to be designed for the temperature uh, that the heat pump can deliver, which is quite a bit lower than what most hydronic heating systems are designed for. For example, most hydronic systems use 160 to 180 degree Fahrenheit water most air to water heat pumps will deliver 110 or 120 degree water. But if it's a radiant floor heating system, that might be perfectly adequate. So that's one possibility. There's also water to water, which is basically a ground source coupled uh, to a uh, hydronic system indoors as well. Okay, thank, thank you so much, Bob. Um, can you maybe just someone just repeat the cold climate heat pump? Like, um, what is the difference there? I know Bob was in your presentation, but someone else basically asking that question again. Um, they may yeah, you know, that. well, the, and, and there's rightfully some confusion here because there are unfortunately uh, 
different definitions of what a cold climate heat pump is. I would say, first of all, uh, by definition, a ground source heat pump is a cold climate heat pump, full stop. So if you go ground source, you've got a cold climate heat pump. Uh, if you talk about an air source heat pump, then typically cold climate would include uh, a variable speed compressor. It means it's got an inverter drive, not just a two-stage compressor, but complete inverter driven variable speed compressor, uh, a variable speed indoor blower, um, and it'll have a heating seasonal uh, performance factor. Sorry for the jargon, but that's the standard rating. That's uh, preferably 10 and up, or perhaps nine and a half and up, maybe. Um, as Steve alluded to earlier, if you find something that's on, if you're looking for an air source heat pump, probably the best resource is to look at the uh, NEEP qualified products list uh, and cross-reference the mass save list. And, and um, if it's on the NEEP list, it's, uh, it's probably a cold climate heat pump. And if it's on the mass save list, uh, it, I don't, the mass save list, I think allows some products that are not on the, cold, on the uh, NEEP cold climate heat pump list, but it's still probably a pretty decent uh, heat pump. But there is some judgment call on where to draw the line. Okay, thanks, Bob. Um, someone asked here about mini splits, but they, this applies to pretty much any heat pump installation. Um, asking, you know, is a manual J required to accurately determine the size of the unit needed for any room? Um, they mentioned that the actual measurements weren't taken when they had a vendor come and give them a quote. And I don't know if this is just one of those variations depending on your installer. Um, one person commented back said that a lot of installers tend to overestimate the BTUs and. I thought that was important in the heat pump case to make sure that you get an accurate, so that it's not running all the time or um, uh, something along those lines. Um, I don't know who. Yeah, it's a, it's um, whether you put in a heat pump or any heating system, uh, it's common for installers to be quite conservative. In other words, they tend to um, size the heating capacity so that they never get a call back. That's what they're trying to avoid. They don't want anyone calling them back when they don't have enough heat. Um, technically speaking, installers are supposed to do manual J calculations. Some of them do them, maybe many of them do them. Some of them do them once you've placed a deposit, they'll do that to confirm that they've quoted you the right size. But even if they do the manual J, which is quite labor intensive, there's still some judgment factors that go into the calculations in terms of how well insulated and air sealed your home is. Um, so uh, there's still room to build in conservatism there. It is a tricky area and it's one where um, we at the Heat Smart Alliance try to help people through when we coach, but uh, um, you know, we have some ways of doing some spot checks on what uh, installers quote. But the best way is just to ask questions and, and certainly ask an installer if you're serious about working with them, how did you come up with the uh, design heating load you're using and, and see how they answer the question. Okay, thank you, Bob. Um, one person did ask in here about um, getting access to the slides, and um, I think we, we talked about this at the very beginning that, yeah, the slides in, a record, in the recording will be made available after the, um, you know, uh, probably within the next few days will be posted up onto the West for Climate Action website. So we'll have that available for everyone. Um, does anyone, any of the, the panelists having looked over the questions too in the chat, have seen anything that I may have missed? Uh, there's a lot of, I got to tell you, um, there's a lot of excellent questions in here and I really do appreciate the, a lot of uh, residents have some experience here and able to answer some of the questions directly, which was great. I just wanted to do a quickly address a question that came up about refrigerants. Uh, and to your point, Jim, about a very knowledgeable audience here. Um, so I don't know the exact uh, phase out schedule that the EPA has for uh, HFC refrigerants like uh, 410A, which is commonly used in uh, heat pumps today. But I think I can safely say, don't worry about it. Uh, these phase outs are designed not to cripple people and cripple the economy here or there. 
you're going to be allowed to use the 410A for a considerable amount of time, just like uh, R22, the, the older refrigerant. There's still people using R22 in their uh, air conditioners and even some heat pumps. And um, that was phased out long ago. I can't even remember how long ago it was. And so this, uh, these phase outs apply to new equipment, new installations. You'll still be able to service your heat pump over its life um, if you get a unit that's 410A. I just, uh, Paul here, just uh, to maybe uh, add something to, Bob, uh, to Bob's comment that the R410 refrigerant uh, although it's not ozone depleting, has a it does have a very significant global warming potential. You know, you know, much, much, much higher than uh, um, even methane. And so there's a real push in the industry to find a a chemical that will refrigerant that will that will have both um, uh, no effect on ozone as well as a low <coughs> a low global warming potential. And there are um, refrigerants under development and qualification that would allow a backfit or a retrofit to an existing system. Uh, for example, R470A is being tested now as a potential backfit to a, an existing system. So in the future, there's likely to be opportunities to replace uh, the high global warming potential get, uh, refrigerant with something better, better suited. But even, even following up on that briefly, um... While the current refrigerants do have high global warming potentials, that refrigerant has to leak before it's a problem. And there's a relatively small amount of refrigerant in, in your system. Um, and uh, it's, it'll make a little bit of difference on average with the carbon savings, but uh, uh, it, it's not going to change things too much. Uh, it's worth addressing. That's why the EPA is addressing it. Uh, but it's not a reason to avoid getting a heat pump. And the other thing to keep in mind is if you have central air conditioning, you have exactly the same potential for refrigerant leakage as a heat pump. It's no different. Um, and so in that case, you know, uh, I wouldn't be too, too concerned about the uh, type of refrigerant in your heat pump. We're going to improve the heat pump technology. Both the refrigerants will improve, the efficiency will improve. Uh, everything's going to improve over time. But, uh, you know, we've got pretty good products right now. And I would encourage people to consider them and not worry too much. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, the, the last question I see here is, um, and I think it, it's already been addressed somewhat, but. Uh, there is obviously some concern with uh, going to a brand new technology and the backup in case it gets too cold, given that we live in New England. And so I, I do see some hesitancy in, in some, and you know, about this person says like they, um, do I need to keep my backup gas furnace, you know, if I go to a centralized heat pump solution? And uh, I guess we would say with a cold, cold climate heat pump, you should be okay, you know, but uh, I can understand, you know, it's kind of why people like people buy a Prius, you know, with the <laughs> hybrid, because you, you don't trust the battery to take you the whole way. So you, you have the gas engine as a backup. But um, I think it's, it's maybe some of this is because some of us are, it's, it's a new technology and we're not all familiar with it. And, uh, and I think as time goes on, I think this will get, as we get more knowledgeable and more people make this transition, I think it will get easier um, to just go purely to the heat pump. Um, does that move Again, on if, you, uh, if you weatherize an air seal, your house as much as possible. That goes a long way to allowing you to have less or even no backup heating system. And on, so on that note, um, we made our best shot at the, there's a lot of comments in the chat. I really do appreciate it. We're gonna, we're gonna wrap it up tonight um, for, the, for the webinar. I just wanna put a big thank you out to, um, to Neil, to Bob, Stephen, uh, Paul, and Tom, you know, for for your presentations. Really, there's obviously a lot of interest in the in the uh, in our in our town uh, for more information on this. And there's a lot of questions out there. And uh, and this is that's the kind of information that they needed. So really appreciate that. Um, and I just want to thank you all for joining uh, the meeting tonight. Um, here's the, we just put some additional links here on the page for um, you know different places you might want to contact. Uh, but I just want to say that. Uh, you know, a recording of this session will be made available on Westford CAT and on the Westford Climate Action website, along with the slides. Um, we'd all love to hear from you um, if you have any other questions or interest in other webinars. And um, 
Thank you so much for joining and have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thank you.